Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Arakal people of the Banjalong Nation as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we record and produce this podcast. I pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. This episode of the Production Talk podcast is brought to you by mixartist.com.au. Whether you're looking for a top-notch recording studio on Australia's east coast or if you're looking for online music mixing from wherever you are in the world, mixartist.com.au has the experience and expertise to take your audio to the next level. With our high-end recording studio and online mixdown capabilities, you can achieve the sound you've been dreaming of. So head over to mixartist.com.au and let's make some music magic. Welcome to the Production Talk podcast. Join us as we explore the creative and technical aspects of music production with expert guests, practical tips and exclusive insights. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, you'll find something valuable in every episode of the Production Talk podcast. If you love what you're hearing, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, why not follow Mix Artist on social media? So grab your headphones, turn up the volume, and let's get started with another episode of the Production Talk podcast with your host, Jan Muffs. Roll the tape. Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the next episode of the Production Talk podcast. It is fantastic to have you all on board again. Thank you so much for joining me today. First and foremost, let me explain what's been going on. I've been on a long break, much, much longer than I initially planned, and I have a lot to share with you. And I want to lay out the reasons and explain what's been happening on my end. But before we get into all of the details, let's first start with all the news. So the most important news for me is that the podcast is now available as a video podcast as well. And it's now also going out to YouTube. So you can follow us on YouTube. You can still listen to the audio podcast in all the normal places like Apple Podcast or Google Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. But of course, the video version is now also online if you want to see my face. <laughs> of course, it's up to you. So that's one of the biggest news. It's also technically quite challenging for somebody who's not a video specialist, but I think you'll see it will grow as we go. For the next coming episodes, I have a couple of fantastic interviews lined up. Not every single one of them was recorded as video, but still they will be available as video podcasts with still pictures instead. However, more future episodes will come out as a video podcast, which I hope you will enjoy a lot. Then, of course, I had to change podcast providers, but that's an entirely different story. Your feed should work as expected. Just trust me that it took me countless hours to work out all the details in the background. But OK, that's all sorted. Everything is working and it shouldn't make a difference for you. That's just an internal side note. Also, the show notes have been completely reworked from scratch, which again took me, I don't know, how many hours, countless evenings at night on the couch with my laptop to figure all this out. But it's now in better design, in newer design, and most importantly, a more consistent design. And on a side note, also one that is much quicker for me to release, which is a big topic of today's session. I want to talk about time and value. That's the big subject for today. And then, of course, the Production Talk podcast has also received a bit of a facelift. We have a new opening music and very importantly, we have the fantastic opening lines by a professional speaker. So let me just spend a couple of moments to talk about what's been happening on my end. I've taken a relatively long break to rethink lots of things in my life. And it all started with me literally running out of time time it's a limited resource and when my business the studio started to really pick up i literally started to run out of time to invest into the podcast and i really had to rethink how things were going and at the same time i also decided to take a break from all my teaching responsibilities so i'm currently on long service leave so that i can spend my entire time on doing this 
no, the recording studio business and the mixing business. And it's been actually very busy over the last couple of months. And it took me a long time to come up with a solution to do both. And I think I had to bite the bullet and ask for some help to figure things out. And in my case, this was the help of a business coach who was a little scary for me, <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, but I had to put out all my business details in front of a stranger and got some real, real honest feedback from somebody who knows their stuff much better than I do. And I learned a lot from that. I want to call this brutal truth. You know, the things that were not pleasant to hear, but very healthy for me to realize, especially about how I manage money and time, which of course are the big two factors that drive a business. But not only business, of course, also our private lives and to a large degree, your music career. So today's episode, I would like to dedicate to sharing what I've learned over the last couple of months with you, talk about what practical implications this has on my recording studio business and how this could also apply to you as a musician. Because if you want to know about it or not, as a musician, you are pretty much a business. Business is what you are doing. You are not on a salary. And so therefore, there's a lot that can be learned of, of value. So I want to share everything that I've taken out of it. So my business coach made me have a very critical look at my profit and loss statements. This is a very boring part of running a business. It's part of the bookkeeping. But in many ways, it is actually a very important thing. And I always loved to do all the creative work, all the recording, hanging out with musicians here and doing the amazing music that's been coming out of these rooms. But sitting at home going through the books, well, it hasn't been my favorite part of the business anyway. But nevertheless, it's very important. And profit and loss, you can imagine this to be like a bit of a, a speedometer. It's like a gauge that shows you how you're traveling. And it also helps to perform better. So that's something that I learned when I was a young bloke at school doing 800 meter runs for sports. And there was a day when I was just doing the run all by myself, nobody to compete against. And very interestingly, the time that I scored was okay, but not fantastic. The week after, I was competing against somebody else. There were many people running at the same time. And interestingly, my time was much better just because I had somebody to compare myself to and see how I was going. And it gave me the drive to try to beat the other people. Another example where this happens in my life is with just a simple thing. When I drive, I actually quite enjoy it. However, the one thing I really don't like is to stop at the servo for refueling because I really don't like giving them my money. One of the things that I can do in my car is display the current fuel consumption. So as I drive, it shows me how much I'm currently using. And I love this just because it triggers me to think about beating the numbers. I shift a gear down when I go downhill to use the compression braking and I immediately notice that this reduces my fuel consumption. It is another little example where having numbers actually helps me drive my behavior in a better direction for the planet and, of course, for my wallet. So that's where the profit and loss statement comes into play for a business. It gives me something to look at, how I did last month, and it gives me now something to aim for. This month, I try to better that. How does this apply to you as a musician? Well, Profit and loss is a really dry bookkeeping statement, but you can also rephrase this as time and value. So, in other words, the profit that you generate as a musician can be measured in, in money. It can also be measured in energy. And this is actually something that I personally really like. So, let's say if you busk in the streets and you've got a bad place and you busk all by yourself and there's nobody there. That's what I would call a situation where your energy is not giving you any return. In other words, there's no flow of energy. It's not going from you to somebody else. However, if you come back another day, you get a better spot, there's a crowd gathering. Now the energy transfers from you to somebody else. And suddenly there's a transfer of energy. That is how we can measure our profits. Because without the people receiving the positive energy that your music is, there's simply no transfer of energy. 
So we can think about your life as a musician and the time you spend effectively transferring positive vibrations, if you want to call it so, positive energy through your music to others. That's when you are most valuable. That's the time when you are very valuable. There are other moments as well. Let's say when you spend three hours cleaning up your rehearsal room and rolling cables. Don't get me wrong, this is necessary every once in a while, but there is actually no transfer of positive energy towards others and therefore there won't be any return for you from this, except for having a nice rehearsal room. So we could say that although both of these things are important, one of them is more valuable than the other. And this is really what a profit and loss balance is all about. To look at all the things we do on a daily basis and focus on the things that actually do provide value to others and also the things that don't. And to drive your music business into the right direction, You need to do the same thing that my business coach taught me. You need to reduce the amount of time that you spend without transferring positive energy to others and increase the time where you do provide value to other people. So that sounds really simple at first, but practically, of course, it is not as easy. And for my business, this has been a painful, long thinking process with several failures along the way and rethinking and redoing it and learning. But I think I'm heading in a good direction. So, for example, for me, for my business, if I'm here recording a band, then I'm literally providing a value to somebody else and they walk away with something that they couldn't have done without me. That is providing value. This is something really important. But then also comes the time when I, let's say, go shopping for tea and cookies. I provide tea and cookies for my, for, my, for my clients. If I do this on business hours, that is actually not something that provides much value directly. So I try to no longer do this during the time I work, but I try to do it on the weekend as I do the family shopping as well. I'd kill two birds with one stone. And rather than going to the shops in the morning every day, I just do it once a week when I'm already at the shops for my family shopping. So that takes all the extra time out that I usually spend to do simple basic shopping. I never considered this to be a big deal, but if you sum this up every day, it actually equates to a lot of time. So what I'm trying to do is reduce the time that I spend on things that are not providing a direct value to others. The important part is to really think about the time that you spend on tasks that don't provide a value to others and find a quicker way to get better results so that you spend less time on that. Once you manage to cut back, you gain time, which of course now needs to be invested into the other things, the moments when you do provide value. So for you, this could be to rethink what you do at rehearsals. So maybe think about how much time you actually spend in the rehearsal room practicing your music. Maybe there is a lot of time when you chatter. And nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a value for this as well. But maybe think about whether you can cut back a little bit and spend more time actually practicing the one part in the song that is a little bit tricky to play and play this 10 times in a, in a loop instead. When you play gigs... This is the prime example. Now, when you play gigs, then there's a direct transfer of energy from you to others. That's when you are most valuable. The time that you spend at a gig, that's when you are worth a lot of money. However, if you, if you spend many hours preparing your merchandising for shipping, fulfilling merchandise orders, well, this now adds a lot of hours to your job and whatever income you have needs to be divided across those hours so that brings your hourly rate down. So what I'm trying to say is that you may want to look at options to reduce the time you spend on fulfilling merchandise. It could also be that you look at getting more work done in less time. It could be that you decide to outsource this to somebody else. Maybe there's, I don't know, a teenager, <laughs> the neighbor's kid, who knows, who would like to work for a relatively low wage or a pocket money and just help you out for a couple of hours. That's where you can free up some time and invest this into other tasks that provide more value. 
There's other moments in your life. Let's say you spend time on the phone calling up all the local venues for gigs to play. This is probably a very, very valuable time for you because when you spend, let's say, three hours this afternoon calling up 15 different people and then sending follow-up emails, that's when you actually spend time that has a direct return for you because you now get gigs out of it. That's a time that's really well spent. So I would like to take this a little bit further and now talk about what this actually meant for my podcast, because this way of thinking, this way of thinking as I learned from my business coach through a huge spanner in the works for my podcasting, I actually had to write down numbers in front of my business coach and write down the time that I spend on coming up with ideas for the podcast, producing it, post-production publishing and then all the marketing and i actually had a look at it and i averaged it at 1.5 days of work for every single episode let me just think back for a second let me just take a deep breath here deep down i knew but seeing these numbers black and white on a sheet of paper in front of me made me think okay that's one and a half days that i'm not actually spending in the studio with clients This is also one and a half days that I'm not making an income for my family. That was confronting for me. It was not the truth that I wanted to hear, but it was healthy to hear it anyway. So that's what I needed to hear. And then the business coach asked me to write down the return I'm getting from this. So I think there is a big return on sending my positive energy your way. That is something that is very valuable and I deeply believe from the bottom of the, my heart that this is something that in whatever form I want to continue. I want to be a giver. I want to share knowledge. But looking at the gauge again, at the speedometer of my business, I needed to map the time I spent against the monetary value that I got in return. And I don't have a business case. That's what my business coach told me black and white up front in my face as yeah the brutal truth that I guess I needed to hear. The business coach told me stop podcasting immediately unless you come up with a better way. And that's what's been on my mind for many, many weeks and months. Production Talk fans, we know you're loving the show, but are you following us on social media yet? Our channels are your backstage pass to all things music production. We've got exclusive content, sneak peeks, and occasionally some insider tips from Jan's studio. So hit that subscribe button and follow us on social to join the conversation and stay in the loop. Head over to speakpipe.com slash production talk. It's your chance to get your own voice onto the Production Talk podcast. It could be a question, it could be a comment, it could be some feedback or something exciting that you want the podcast community to hear. Head over to speakpipe.com slash production talk. I would love to hear from you. You rock. So I looked at it from both angles again. I looked at the value that I'm providing. So when I'm right here in the moment, making a podcast episode, sending something out to you, I still believe that there's a certain value to it as an energy transferring from me to you and I love doing it but I also need to come up with a way to reduce my time so that is something that I spent again a lot of time on researching so I came up with methods to edit my podcast differently and that actually means I'm stepping away from editing in Pro Tools that's what I used to do I had to face the brutal truth that there is another way that ends up being faster, but first I had to learn it. So I'm now using a different editor that actually saves me time on the long run. But the learning curve of actually getting to the point of being so fast to actually justify this new workflow, that took me a while. I was actually really fast in Pro Tools, but I now needed to step out of it, learn a new piece of software, And I was really bad at it at first, so I spent a lot of time researching and so on and so on. And I was very ineffective at first. It took me much longer to produce an episode. So I had to learn this first. And now I'm at a point where, yes, I can beat my protest time. So I'm now better and faster in another piece of software. 
than I am in Pro Tools. So in other words, I've now learned to produce an episode in less time. And my goal is to spend not more than three hours per episode. That is a huge amount of time saving from about a day and a half. For that, I also had to learn how to handle my website much better. Because before that, the publishing process through the aggregators, through my website, was a lot, a lot, a lot of manual labor. And that means, again, I had to learn a lot about web development. In this case, I'm using Wix for my website. I had to learn how to program databases and feed them into dynamic pages. It gets really technical. And for somebody who's got no background in, in web design, this was a major catastrophe at first. I pulled my hair out, <laughs> but I got through it eventually. I'm starting to wrap my head around it and I can now publish the episodes through my website through a new aggregator or publisher much faster than I could before. And interestingly, that aggregator is actually costing me less than my past publishing tool. So I'm now saving money and time, which gets me into the good books with my business coach. That's exactly how it should be. <laughs> good. So, uh, yeah, long story short, what does all of this mean for my podcast? I managed to produce it in less time at a better quality. And I still found a way to get past my business coach and managed to have the podcast transfer knowledge, valuable wisdom nuggets, whatever energy you want to call it, from me to you. But there's one more aspect that, um, that we also need to look at here. I would like you to tell me what type of a podcast listener you are. It could be that you are the active type. It might be that you are sitting right next to a sheet of paper and a Sharpie and every knowledgeable or every, every new piece of information you write down immediately and by the end of today it's implemented and you got a value out of it for you. That would be great because there's another energy transfer from what you hear through your podcast player to you into something actionable that actually makes your music career better. I hope that's you. I hope that's you. Then you might be more of a casual listener and you might be listening in. You like the entertainment. Maybe you listen while you drive. And every once in a while, a little piece of information comes along. And on the long run, maybe from a collection of 10 great things that you learn, you might implement one or two. Hmm, okay, still there's something there. But I think we could all agree that, again, looking at the time you spend listening and the outcome, in this scenario, that could be better. And then, of course, there is the third example, the binge listener who listens to every single episode and never implements anything. Well, I still hope you have a great time listening to this podcast, but that's really not what I'm here for. If you never put any of the things that I share with you into action, then I'm either not providing good value, or maybe you know it all already, or maybe you're just not transferring the energy, because what's the point of it? If you don't ever turn it into something valuable for you, then you're better off not listening to this podcast, but doing something else. Maybe you should practice your instrument or maybe work a couple of extra hours in your job or maybe spend more time with your family than to listen to this podcast. So where am I going with all of this? Podcasts won't be the only offering. That's my point here. I would like to offer something to you that is actionable, that comes with practical implementations. And therefore, I'm very proud to announce that we are now offering workshops at the studio, in-studio workshops. So the first one that I started is a recording engineer workshop. It's a workshop that is aiming towards other professional producers, freelance engineers, the kind of people who record their clients, sometimes here, sometimes there. Freelance engineers who sometimes just work from home, sometimes need a bigger studio. And this workshop is designed to take the scary part out of operating all these gears. It explains every single thing that I do start to finish. This workshop is offered in person, so you can hang out with me in a small team. And if that's not for you, you can also participate online and complete it all in your own pace. So this is something where I try to transfer 
knowledge in a way that it can be applied straight away. There is, of course, the risk that people participate and never do anything with the knowledge they gained. That's why I decided to add a price tag to it. However, it also comes with a reward. And the reward is very simple. People who participate in this course will then get $50 off for every studio booking. In other words, after a couple of studio bookings, they've made the money worth and then they actually make a benefit or have a better deal every day on. This is to encourage action. Then, of course, the course is available online as well. However, it's really only beneficial for people who either want to know about how I engineer or who want to come in and operate this studio by themselves, which is, I believe, a very small niche, a very small percentage of our listeners here. But I've also made another a course online that is probably beneficial for pretty much everybody. It's called Monetize Your Music in Six Simple Steps. And this is free for every listener. And I will keep it free, I promise. It is available now on my website and it is explaining the most basic steps. So if you're a super advanced musician who's really good at monetizing music, you may not get too much out of it. But you can still do it just to double check if you actually covered all the grounds. Maybe there's something you missed. But most importantly, this online course is aiming at people who are at the beginning of their music career and who want to check if they have set themselves up the right way with actionable steps. So that's something that I would like to share with the public today. It's all on my website, and of course, I'm going to put the link into the show notes. But a starting point is to go to mixartist.com.au and scroll down to the online courses. This is just a starter. A lot of the things that I believe needs action on your end will become online courses. So I'm already working on the next one. I want to set up a course on setting up the digital infrastructure for a band or an artist. I would like to talk about social media and marketing and promotion. And there's other things that I also want to offer in addition to the podcasts, of course. So this now goes hand in hand. This is me offering something that will hopefully transfer my knowledge, my energy across to you and comes out the other end in actionable steps, in a measurable difference for you. That's the goal. And I hope that you all enjoy what I have to offer there. Let's just sum it up one more time. So what can you take out of today's episode? Time and money, those are values that you can easily measure. I often talk about the energy that I like to transfer, which is maybe a little bit of a gray area and not easily measured, but time and money definitely is. And I think most of us, we can all agree that we would like to have a bit more money and spend a I'm working for it. So that's generally the direction that we need to aim for, reducing the time and effort we put into it and get a better value out of it. This is something that is very dear to my heart. And I'd like to invite you to really think about all the steps that you go through and ask yourself, how much time did you spend on it and was it worth it? So let's come up with a couple of examples. As a musician, chances are you are the composer, songwriter, arranger of your own art. This is something that you could outsource if you like. So a lot of high-end musicians hire external songwriters. But you might decide that this is really your superpower and you want to keep doing it for the love of it. That's a very fair point. So maybe this is not what you want to outsource. Good point. Very good point. At some stage, you want to take your songs once they're written and release them. So therefore, you now need to go through the production steps. That's recording, mixing, mastering. That's what I would call production. So when it comes to recording, you can probably do a lot of things at home equally well. If you record electric guitars into, let's say, a DI box or into the instrument input of your interface and you use reamps, don't book a studio. That's not the right thing to do. It's too expensive for the outcome. You can do this just as well at home. MIDI keyboard, same thing. You can record the performance perfectly fine at home. No need to go to a studio. Drums, mm, that's another story. I think that if you try to record drums at home, usually a studio can get a better outcome here. And I also think the same applies for vocals. 
Good. Let's talk about mixing for a moment. Mixing is something that a lot of people do themselves and there's nothing wrong with that. But let's also add the factor time in. So if you mixed your own music, think about how much time did it take. There's a very good chance that if you hire somebody else who mixes on a regular basis and does it for a living, we can get a really, really good outcome in a lot less time. If it takes you 20 hours to mix one song, think about it. You know, you could, uh, let's not talk about me, let's talk about somebody else we had in our podcast. Let's say Kamal Engels. You can hire Kamal to mix your song for X amount of dollars. Divide the money spent for Kamal over 20 hours. That now gives you your hourly rate. There's a very good chance that if you calculate this number and honestly look at the numbers, you realize that you are working for a very low hourly wage. So one thing you could consider is to spend the 20 hours doing your daytime job or playing gigs and think about how much money you make this way. This might pay for Kamal to do it the proper way. You see where I'm coming from? I don't want to say that this is exactly how it needs to be for you. Maybe you want to continue to mix at home by yourselves, but look at the time and money value. Let's take it to the next step, mastering. Compared to mixing, mastering is a relatively affordable process. So you can get one of the best mastering engineers in the country for approximately 150 per song. You can get some really good quality mastering from engineers locally in the area. I would say it starts under 100, maybe just over 100 in that general pocket per song. You can get fantastic sounding masters. Okay, let's do the time and value check again. You could go to an online service and do it for a couple of dollars or sometimes for free. Well, how can you beat that? From a time value perspective, that's super fast and it costs just a couple of dollars. What about quality is my question. And that's the big catch-22. The quality of online mastering, in my personal opinion, is not up for it. It's not good enough Every single e-mastering or whatever they're called, I've tested. And although I'm not calling myself a mastering engineer, I don't do this professionally, I still can outmaster each one of them easily. Every single time I take a mix and upload it to those services and compare it to a quick and dirty master that I do, mine is better. It's very simple. So quality is the problem here. But uh, for a demo recording, if you just release a demo for the purpose of a, you know, getting gigs, then this is probably exactly what you must do. It would be a waste to hire the most expensive mastering engineer in the country. But if you release your music for the general public, I would recommend to rethink this a little. Quality is something that, well, you need to get good value here, a good value to quality ratio, but you don't want to go for the cheapest. Trust me, you will regret that. So you could now look at mastering and look at, let's say, let's pick a mastering engineer who offers a, a single for, let's say, $100. And now you could try to master the song yourself. Okay, for that, you, mm, I assume you're not a mastering engineer yet. You might need to do some research. You need to spend time online. You probably want to watch a couple of videos. You might find that you now need to download software and you put it through the processes. Okay, how long is this going to take you? I would say that there's a very good chance that the day after you want to listen to it one more time and realize, oh, oh that wasn't right and you want to go back and fix it. Very quickly, we're at a place where you spend so much time on trying to get it to an acceptable level that it brought your hourly rate down ridiculously. You could have done it for $100 with a professional and now you spend, I don't know, 10 hours researching and trying. That means your hourly rate is now $10. Is that worth it? Hmm. Recording and mixing is very debatable, but when it comes to professional mastering, I end up saying that it's very difficult to get a better value than hiring a professional, in all honesty. But, okay, this is just one example where measuring the time you invest, the quality you get, and also the monetary value might help you to make better decisions. So, moving forward in your music business, 
doesn't mean that you must outsource every single task you do. But it's all about identifying the time wasters. It's about identifying the things that you're not really good at. And put a monetary value to the time that you try. This might help you to make the right decisions and get your productions better and quicker with less effort. I hope this all made sense to you. Let me just go over my notes. I think I'm pretty much done for the day. This episode will be out very soon. I'm very excited to be back. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something out for yourselves. We will be back next week with a big interview with Cass Eager about her music career. I love your music, Cass. Can't wait. Uh, see you next week. Bye for now. That's a wrap for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Production Talk podcast. Thanks to our expert host, Jan Matz, and our sponsor, mixartist.com.au, for making this show possible. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and follow Mix Artist on social media to stay up to date on all things music production. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Just drop us a line at mixartist.com.au slash contact. Until next time. Keep creating and producing great music.